uh, was James Madison. And um, they were about to meet um, representatives from several of the colonies to try, to try to resolve a dispute between Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, uh, and Pennsylvania. Two years before the war uh, ended under the original Articles of Confederation, the uh, Continental Congress was formed. It was a single house legislature provided for no executive. Um, it really didn't have uh, any form of a judiciary. Uh, it was in effect just a loose confederation among uh, the colonies which were still involved in the Revolutionary War. Washington repeatedly uh, sent messages to the effect that uh, uh, no man has felt the effects um, of this, uh, of, of the lack of power in Congress to do anything substantial uh, to aid the Revolutionary War effort. The Articles of Confederation, we go to two, Carrie. The flaws in the Articles of Confederation and, and, and the uh, Continental Congress, you're looking at uh, Philadelphia uh, in the 1780s. Um, the Continental Congress had very, very little power. Um, members did not vote by uh, individuals. Uh, members could only vote by state and you needed uh, uh, nine votes uh, to uh, pass any legislation. To amend the Articles of Confederation, you, need, you needed unanimity. It wasn't working. No state was required to abide by its charter. Uh, there was no judiciary to uh, deal with disputes and uh, there was no executive. The drafters of the Articles had transformed the colonies from being administered by one of the most powerful governments in the world to one of the weakest. And for years uh, before the revolution, the reason why Mar uh, Madison was headed to see George Washington was that uh, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and Pennsylvania had been arguing over who had fishing rights in the Potomac uh, River and the Chesapeake Bay. Representatives from each state, those states, uh, met with Madison and Washington and Mount Vernon. They weren't able to resolve uh, their differences, but they said, let's get together one year from now in Annapolis, Maryland. Well, that would have been in uh, May 1786. A quorum never showed up, but James Madison and Alexander Hamilton did. And that is part of the grain of the story as we move forward. I'm gonna to try to sketch a background uh, on who these men were and the circumstances that brought them together in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. In colonial America, the importance of uh, Greek and Roman antiquity has been substantially forgotten. Uh, except for a very few scholars today, we just don't talk about the, the, the classics. But to leaders of our revolution, um, Greco-Roman antiquity was a part of the vocabulary and their perceived values uh, were just drilled with references to classics. On top of that, uh, colonials named their horses and in the South, they named their slaves. Uh, after classical figures. Madison had a Plato, Jefferson had Jupiter, Caesar and Hercules. Um, going back to the part of classicism, uh, the Senate meets in the Capitol, which references to ancient Rome. Republican is derived from Latin and Democrat is derived from Greek. Uh, a one dollar bill carries e pluribus unum. Um, I think the most visible example is if you're ever going to drive across New York State on the New York State Thruway, you're going to go through Troy, Utica, 
Syracuse, and Ithaca. And on the way, you're going to pass through Cicero, Ovid, and Solon. I think the point's clear. Another important aspect of colonial America's emphasis on classics uh, lies in the concept of virtue. Virtue has a very different meaning today than it did then. Today it refers to morality, uh, essentially uh, feminine morality, but it's been used on both sides. But in those days it had nothing to do with morality. The essential element of public life was virtue. The responsibility for a public servant meeting the good of the many to the maximum possible degree. If you're delegated a public responsibility, your only requirement is to do good. The founders' greatest interest uh, was from the political history of Rome, um, from the conquests in the East and uh, the civil wars in the uh, early first century. In Federalist Papers uh, 34, uh, Hamilton wrote that the Roman Empire uh, attained the utmost height of human greatness. He wouldn't quite meet that by the time we got to uh, Federalist 34, but keep that in mind. Uh, the heroes of the educated landed class who were making decisions on behalf of the new republic uh, were the orators who portrayed uh, the works defending the republic, including Cato and Cicero. Cato's letters were a linchpin of political debate, particularly the skepticism of the exercise of state power. But at the end of the War of Independence, uh, Thomas Paine, remember him? The guy who uh, wrote the famous pamphlet uh, about 11 years before that. At the end of the Revolutionary War, he wrote that we do dishonor and injustice to ourselves if we must go two or 3,000 years back in time for lessons and examples. And he wrote these memorable words, Rome was originally a band of ruffians. Plunder made her rich and her oppression of millions made her great. But America never needs to be ashamed to tell her birth. Of course, Payne admitted slavery from, from that expression, but you get the point. This is one of the earlier departures from the classicism so treasured by the Federalists and would indeed become a central tenet of Jeffersonian democracy later on. Remember uh, the popular sentiment against elitism? Does that sound familiar today? The foundations of the Industrial Revolution were, were put in place by Enlightenment thinkers exploring new technology such as the steam engine. These thinkers applied the uh, methods of scientific inquiry uh, men like Edward Gibbon, who invented the uh, writing of history <clears throat> about the, the fall of the Roman Empire, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations and economics, and especially uh, James Hutton for modern geology, particularly James Hutton, as we'll see. The Scotch and the Scottish influence had an enormous impact on where this country was going. Scott, Scotland's influence on the United States cannot be overstated. It had Scotland by this period of the 18th century had attained a much higher literacy rate uh, than had the UK. Why? Because 200 years before that, the Presbyterian Church, a Calvinistic uh, um, a branch of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the church, um, put in place a mandate that everybody, uh, every single town in Scotland must have a teacher who teaches Latin. Why? So they could read the Bible. They could read the Bible, they could read everything else. The literacy, literacy went, rate went up. 
more important that Scotland and universities compare to uh, the United Kingdoms or England or the British at that time uh, far surpassed uh, their standard. First of all, to teach in a in, in, at Cambridge or Oxford, you had to take an oath of allegiance to the Church of England, which meant that um, Catholic and Orthodox teachers uh, could simply not teach in those two schools. Meanwhile, at the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, they were teaching uh, Sir Isaac Newton's mathematical breakthroughs before Newton's own Cambridge and Oxford were teaching there. They were way ahead of everybody else and they were much more cosmopolitan uh, than, than, than England. See, England's in two universities, the ones that were extant at the time, uh, I'm sure there were others, but they were the pr predominant ones, were regarded as, uh, as uh, nothing more than dens for the rich and the idle. James Hutton, the uh, Scottish scientist, virtually created the field of geology. He conceived of a geology, ge geological uh, scan of time um, beyond anything that any humans had been writing about. And he did it by watching how rock formations developed. Um, this is at a time when the conventional wisdom of both uh, the Presbyterian Church, the Church of England and the Vatican uh, were that the earth was just over 6,000 years old. Uh, Hutton perceived that the age of the earth was way beyond what humans were comprehending hundreds of millions of years. Years later, Darwin, who was reading Hutton on his uh, voyages on the SS Beagle, uh, and his later conversations with Adam Smith's series of theories of, of the free market, uh, applying to the natural world, that, that was a, a cocktail of learning uh, and an advanced thought that was permeating all over the United States. But the, the greatest influence on uh, American Enlightenment thinking was not a Scotsman. Uh, he was a Frenchman, uh, Montesquieu. Uh, in his spirit of laws, uh, he created an entirely new world of, of uh, public discourse. Uh, the abolition of slavery, moderation, constitutionalism, pre preservation of liberties, world peace, concepts that weren't being discussed. Certainly it was not in King George's curriculum. So we go to the founders. Now George Washington um, is of all of the founders, uh, the least educated, um, but is regarded as uh, the most Roman of all. He was, uh, he admired Cato uh, was home taught uh, the, how Cato and uh, other great orators of the Roman era uh, spoke. I won't go into Washington's uh, extensive history uh, of public service, but keep in mind that after Bunker Hill, uh, Washington suffered a series of really, really deadly uh, defeats uh, in Brooklyn um, and, and, and uh, Manhattan Heights um, uh, and all the way over to New, New Jersey. Um, he chose at that time to go head on against the British Army. He had also studied another hero uh, of Rome, Fabius, the famed uh, general who defeated Hannibal, uh, not by taking him head on in, in battle, but by avoiding him, uh, by uh, attacking his flanks, uh, by doing guerrilla warfare, and finally wearing down Hannibal, where after 10 years, he just got in the boats and sailed back to, uh, to uh, North Africa 
uh, with nothing in hand. Washington slowly and gradually through the beginning and the end of the revolution realized that he could never uh, defeat the British head on, uh, that he would also uh, learn that the use of militias, of local militias could be very useful in carrying on guerrilla uh, insurrection. He also left us one major, uh, one major gifted as it were, um, for purposes of how the constitution was later interpreted. Washington simply quashed in the bud dissent by uh, military men. There was just no dispute as to who was in charge. And when a, a group of uh, officers had threatened uh, to uh, petition Congress for some back pay, Washington said, we can't confuse uh, civil matters with, uh, with uh, political matters and military matters. So that is what Washington left us. John Adams, a brilliant Boston lawyer, and according to all segments of history, uh, one of the more disagreeable members of the uh, founding fathers, uh, had a newspaper column as a lawyer in the mid 1760s. At that time, the UK, Britain had established the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act required taxes on newspapers and on lawyers for whatever they said. I'm oversimplifying what it said, but that was a major form of dissension, a uh, source of dissension in colonial uh, uh, Boston. And Madam, Adams and then later Madison saw the new world, the new colonies uh, to be future homes of not just waves of immigrants, but of millions of immigrants. They among the founders were probably the most strategic and forward thinking. And, it, and when Adam was writing his uh, columns um, in the Boston Gazette, he reminded his viewers that their ancestors who came over earlier in the 1600s uh, were historians, poets, and philosophers. They did not need to live by the divine right of rights of kings. And Adams forwarded the revolutionary thought at the time that liberty must at all hazards be supported. We have a right to it derived from our maker. If there could have been an overriding theme of pre-revolutionary agitators, it was what Adams said next. The American people have no need for a king to stand between them and God. Rather, they had a God-given right to liberty. That was essentially the anthem of the revolutionary Massachusetts. Before the convention in Philadelphia, Adams had been sent as an emissary to England in a letter to a friend uh, in 1786, Adams wrote regarding the Roman Empire that consuls bring an element of monarchy, the Senate an aspect of aristocracy, the people also holding power uh, in the form of tribunes who convinced to acts of the consuls and Senate. The best constitution he wrote was before it was written is that which partakes of all these three elements. This separating council senators and tribunes deeply influenced uh, the founders and many others of the revolutionary period. And it became a key element of what would become later on known as the Virginia plan. Um, Thomas Jefferson is uh, known to history uh, much more for Sally Hemings than for uh, much else, although he was our third president. He initiated the 
uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase and Lewis and Clark's Exploration of the Northwest. He also as a child and throughout his life kept a commonplace book, a book, uh, a diary of particular influence uh, to him where he would cut out passages that he liked and would keep. Um, is one of his favorites was Alexander Pope's essay on man, particularly this entry, which he copied in his diary. Know thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Jefferson's probably the most complex and least understood of the founders. He was a, pat he was a patriot, but he did not fight in the War of Independence. He criticized slavery repeatedly, but did nothing to end it. He was inquisitive, but not with his feet. He lived on the edge of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, on the edge of what would be the next explored territory to become West Virginia and Ohio later on, but he never went there. He did spend a lot of time in Europe and he probably traveled there as, uh, as others uh, said later on, um, because it was simply a lot more comfortable than the American frontier. James Madison of the founders was, was most influenced by the Scottish Enlightenment. He was born into a land wealthy family. He was just over five feet tall and just over a hundred pounds. His health was frail. Uh, his study habits, however, were relentless. And uh, this uh, slight frail man, man from the Shenandoah Valley would almost single-handedly draft, debate, compromise, and oversee the ratification of our constitution. He selected uh, as a university, the College of New Jersey, better known today as Princeton, but then it was a land grant school had ended its land grant school over uh, its participation in the Revolutionary War. Um, that's another story. When Harvard students came primarily from Massachusetts and Yale students from Connecticut and William and Mary students, that's where Jefferson had gone, uh, from the uh, Virginia plantations, uh, Princeton was a the first of the geographically uh, dispersed universities. And it was regarded as a hotbed of political activism. Uh, the, royal, the, the people loyal uh, to the crown uh, had a lot of disputes with, uh, with Princeton and its attitude, but it was something like uh, a uh, post-revolutionary Berkeley in the 60s. Uh, John Weatherspoon, the, the president of Princeton, was a heavy influence on, on Madison. And, uh, and Madison and Federalist 10 later on explains how interests can balance each other in a government expressly designed to curb excessive power uh, in any one person or branch. In March of 1784, Madison uh, asked Jefferson who was uh, then as being assigned to help in trade discussions with France and then replaced Benjamin Franklin as ambassador uh, to France. He asked him to ship him books on the history of ancient systems of government, especially confederations. Jefferson did. And he sent Madison literally trunks filled uh, of books. And he invited Madison to take these trunks to his home to Jefferson's home in Monticello uh, and study there, which Madison did for several months. And then Madison took the whole bunch of trunks and books back to his home in Orange, Virginia and stayed in his parents' library, literally for months. Out of that visit, three overarching questions stayed with Madison. How can, a how can a republic remain sustainable? Can a large and expanding nation even be a genuine republic? How can smaller entities confederate into something larger? 
Is there a way for a nation to will the power of a large state while retaining the flexibility of a smaller state? In February of 1787, a few months before the convention, Madison wrote to an assistant, the present system neither has nor deserves advocates. Of course, that present system was the Confederation, the Articles of Confederation under which there was a non-national government. No money is flowing into the public treasury. Not a single state complies with requisitions. And here is where Madison, I think, turned the conceptual corner that set the underpinnings of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He would join in that upsetting with Madison, and I'm sure, um, and I'm sure uh, Jefferson. But at this point, he wrote the classical concept of civic virtue, of selfless men acting noble and for the good of the entire republic. To Matt, became to Madison an obsolete theory. It was time to accept that, quote, all civilized societies are divided into different states and in different factions, creditors and debtors, mercantiles and, and manufacturers, religious sects, inhabitants of different states. These were facts of political life that Madison recognized. In letters to, to Washington and to Edmund Randolph, the governor of, uh, of, uh, Vermont, of Virginia, uh, Madison laid out the outlines of what would become known as the Virginia Plan, the core of which would become the document that had endured for two and a half years, uh, two and a half centuries, I'm sorry, uh, which our officials have sworn to uphold. Yeah. All right, Alexander Hamilton. Forget what you saw in the fictionalized Broadway musical. He was a brilliant man, Washington's uh, favorite writer. Um, he was not a gentleman encumbered by a lot of self-doubt when he led an artillery battalion into Princeton, New Jersey for the Battle of Princeton, just after Valley Forge, uh, he saw a building, which happened to be Nassau Hall, which is still there at Princeton. That building had a portrait of King George III hanging from its rafters. That building was destroyed by Alexander Hamilton. Um, John Adams called Hamilton the uh, bastard brat of a peddler. Um, I'm sure others had other names for him. Um, but what he was, was a check on Adams. Adams wanted all out head on war with Britain. Let's get them on the battlefield, Adams said over and over again. Prob primarily because Adam had witnessed Bunker Hill um, in the, uh, in the um, winter of 76 and thought that that's how war would go. But Hamilton knew better. He had fought and Washington listened to him and he urged Washington to adhere to Fabian's uh, Roman Legion concept of limited and guerrilla war when you're facing overwhelming odds. The key to Hamilton's contribution before the Philadelphia Convention was a letter he wrote uh, to Washington. It said, the leagues among us, the leagues among the old Gratian Republic were continuously at war with each other and for want of union fell prey to their neighbors. But in his most quoted passage in that letter to Washington, Hamilton wrote, neither the manners nor the genius of Rome are suited to this Republic or age that we live in. All her maxim, maxims and habits were military, her, go, her government constituted for war. Ours is unfit for it and our situation still less than our constitution invites us to emulate 
the conduct of Rome or to attempt a display of unprofitable heroism. Hamilton is now promoting a theme that would resonate in months in Philadelphia. First, a loosely bound confederation of weak republics, of weak states, is vulnerable to invasion and to internal disarray. A strong central government will be able to defend its republic, its republics against enemies foreign and domestic. While all this was going on in the Berkshires, in Western Massachusetts, a group of Revolutionary War veterans who remained unpaid, which constituted nearly a third of the males in Hampton, Hampshire County, carried debts they could not cover. So they banded together and in the summer and fall of 1786, these men forcibly closed the local courts to stop seizure of forfeited land. In January of 1787, the same group stormed the uh, federal arsenal at Springfield. The Confederation's government in Philadelphia couldn't meet the crisis, they didn't know what to do. The Confederation authorized the use of local men to put down the rebellion, but they couldn't pay the states anything to do it. Finally, uh, the governor of Massachusetts uh, organized a group of local henchmen paid for by Boston merchants uh, to uh, take the journey to Springfield, 80, 90 miles west, four or five days for them. And they soon occupied the arsenal, faced down the uh, rebels, shot and killed and wounded a lot of them. Uh, news of Shays' rebellion. It spread quickly, obviously, through the colonies. And Governor Wilson of Pennsylvania noted how fragile the political situation in the colonies were at that time and how close they were to internal insurrection throughout the states. The Sh Shays uprising uh, effectively set the table for the Constitutional Convention. It highlighted the ineffectiveness and fragility of the Continental Congress and the uprising was important enough to warrant a provision later written into the Constitution, uh, Article 4, Section 4, which guaranteed the state's protection against both foreign invasion and domestic violence. Now you ask, does that occur an event? And the answer is yes. But this was 1787. Uh, District of Columbia wasn't even a twinkle yet in Adams or Washington's or Jefferson's eye. And uh, 240 years later, after enactment of the Constitution, DC is not a state. So didn't have a local militia. Local militia were for states. George Washington wrote to John Jay at the same time, we've probably had too good an opinion of human nature um, in forming our confederation. We must take human nature as we find it. Perfection falls not to mortals. And he later wrote, this period, it was doubtful whether we were able to survive as an independent republic or decline from our federal dignity and to insignificant and rigid fragments of empire. John Jay wrote to Washington saying, our government is unequal to the task assigned it. And the people begin also to perceive its inefficiency. By this time, it was, art it was clear to the people who were paying attention, the Articles of Confederation under their own terms relied on uncoerced civic public virtue. And the daunting problem was how to substitute that classical view of public service 
to a new way of thinking for a system that would play off its vices as Hamilton noted that year, play off its vices to do the work of the virtuous government hoped for in vain by the writers of the Article of Confederation. This had to be very much on Madison's mind as he rode that spring day two years earlier uh, from Orange, Virginia to Mount Vernon for a meeting with George Washington. As I said earlier, they planned a meeting in Annapolis uh, for, for 1786. Um, only three or four people showed up, not even close to a quorum, but Hamilton showed up. And Hamilton and Madison took the opportunity to write a report calling for a national convention a year later, which was accepted. The Constitution, the Constitutional Convention begins in May of 1787. Madison was there first and he was ready to attack the fundamental questions that had haunted him since that ride to Washington's house two years earlier. Should the chief executive be one person? Should each state have one vote in the Senate? Should state governments be abolished? And the biggest question of all, how could a representative government be created that didn't grant the large states, which were then Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, how could the big states not get too much power, yet still embody the will of all the people? When most of the delegates finally gathered and they had a quorum, a quorum on May 29th, uh, 1787, the Virginia delegates offered up its plan conceived and drafted by Madison. Major points, instead of a one house Congress, there would be a two house legislature with the lower house elected by the people, direct election of the people, unheard of in Anglo-American jurisprudence at the time. Second, there would be a national executive and a national judiciary, meaning one or more Supreme tribunals to solve problems like they hadn't been able to solve at George Washington's house uh, in that spring day of 1787. Thus, in a windowless room with closed and guarded doors, in the heat of Philadelphia's late spring and summer, the delegates sat, agreed, argued, compromised, and created our written constitution. As we shall see the next time we meet, um, that constitution was really a peace treaty between the 13 colonies. I blabbed a long time, got left a little time for uh, a substantial amount of time for questions, so fire away. Thank you. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Alan, for that presentation. Um, so any questions, feel free to write them in the chat or to um, raise your hand and I will find you and unmute you. There's a little raise hands. Um, feature in the chat, or you could just actually raise your hands. <laughs> and I will, let's see. Oh, wait, did I see a hand? Uh, Melvin, I saw your hand go up. Hang on one second, Melvin. Let me just, uh, you can unmute yourself. Here we go. Uh, I did it for you. There you go. Okay. okay. You can hear me? Yes. Thank you so right. much. Okay. There was another confederacy uh, initiated in the United States at one time, which was the rebel confederacy, the Confederate States. 
But it also didn't work for the same reason that the Articles of Confederation didn't work, that the states were independent about sending soldiers or sending backup of any kind. So they obviously didn't take a lesson from those Southerners on the Articles of Confederation, I guess. Well, the, the, the big difference, um, you had a foreign power in the original revolution, 3,000 miles away, which had to send, I think at the most they ever had here were 20,000 troops and mm. keeping 20,000 troops 3,000 miles away, given navigation at that time was, was really amazing, amazingly difficult. And they knew that Washington finally figured out they can't keep sending all these troops here. They're just going to be dissipated. Mm -hmm. And he knew from people that were telling uh, us that uh, Parliament didn't have a big stomach for sending more than 20,000 people. So that was one part. Now, uh, for, for the purpose of the Civil War, uh, they called it the Confederacy because they didn't call, want to call it the fraternity or the, <laughs> the Association of Slave States. Um, you know, but, but it really was a battle. That was a head-on battle. And in the end, uh, the North's industrial power made all the difference in the world. The South yeah. just couldn't import enough uh, from wherever they were getting. They weren't getting it from France. And uh, you saw what happened at, uh, at Williamsburg when France. And so they knew they weren't going to get any more metal and no more artillery, no more men. Um, Williamsburg did it, froze the army, and, and they had to leave. So good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Evelyn. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Don't see anything in the chat. Well, okay. I guess you covered everything. Everything was so thorough. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so, do you want to give a? Would you like to give a little uh, plug about our next talk or your next talk with us? Sure. Um, I want to talk about the actual writing of the Constitution? Um, the uh, the factions that developed, the beginnings of the Federalists uh, against uh, Jeffersonian Republicans, Federalists always suspect of uh, being too chummy with the crown and the remnants of the British crown. Uh, the Federalists calling the Jeffersonian Republicans, um, even though this was before the French Revolution, a little too cozy uh, with uh, with uh, those of Jacobian uh, uh, sympathies in France. Um, but how we got to two houses of Congress, how we got to a national judiciary, uh, what the powers of Congress would be, what the powers of Congress would not be, what would be left to the states. The, uh, that's Article One, Article Two, of course, the executive branch and um, what to do about the executive branch, the fight over whether or not the executive ought to be a tribunal or more or selectively picked, how long, how many times, who would pick, should be direct election, oh my God, no, no. What got us to the electoral college? And then the article three, the judiciary. And then there's a whole other story on the ratification process, which I'll try to save some time for. But anyway, that's what I have in mind. Any other suggestions, send them in, we'll be glad. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alan. And we don't have a, um, the date for that, the writing of the constitution is still TBD, but it probably will be at some point in late March or early April. So stay tuned for that. Um, and it will obviously be on our website. Um, so if there aren't any more questions, I think we are um, all set for this evening. Just um, one last time, if anyone has any final questions for Alan, feel free to raise your hand or pop them in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Alan. I always learn so much, uh, honestly, from having you, and it's always just a, a, a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks, um, Steve and Susan. Yeah, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the next uh, topic. And, and please also, if 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 there is 
interest in any other topics, um, particularly around Alan's expertise, um, feel free to, to you know, contact us at the library and we're happy to, uh, to put something together. So I wanna thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, and again, this recording will be up on our YouTube. Uh, you're, getting the, you're getting the muted claps, Alan. <laughs> Good job. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here and I hope everyone has a really great night. Thank you again, Alan. Um, Pleasure. Pleasure to work with you. So, bye, folks. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Have a great night. Stay safe.